welcome uh, back everyone uh, this is the uh, second session of the second day of our uh, uh, fdp on computational synthetic and uh, systems biology in this lecture that i will start now uh, for the next two hour what we will discuss we will discuss about construction and simulation of ode based model essentially up to this the first four lectures that you have heard are all based on developing, except the first one, obviously, the generalized one. All these other three lectures were primarily was on building, you know, network, right? network, network structures and all these things, graph based, graph theory based uh, discussions. What we'll start discussing from today and for next couple of days, multiple lectures will be there, which will deal with dynamics of the system. dynamical models will be discussed. So what I will try to do in this lecture is that I will go into the only the elementary aspects of dynamical modeling, particularly the ODE based model. Let me tell you the intention of this uh, whole presentation is that I know many of you uh, 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 go through often in lectures or papers looked into the different models, mathematical models, which are ODE based models, and sometimes have lots of questions that how people make this model, what is the exact meaning of those equations they are re rewriting, and how the hell they actually do the simulation or analysis, right? So if you are from not that field, it often becomes you know difficult to understand. And that may happen when my other friends and colleagues will start speaking from tomorrow about bifurcation, hysteresis, and all other features like uh, dynamical model of genetic circuit, dynamical models of you know metabolic regulation. Then it may become a bit difficult to understand that how they are creating those models, why they are creating that type of equation, and what is the meaning of those, and how do they help uh, simulate those? So this talk, I will try to prime you to that. So it is essentially elementary. If you are good in calculus and differential equation, then this course, uh, this particular talk is not for you. But as I understand the uh, educational background, the diverse educational background uh, in this uh, of the participants of this FDP, we decided that we, we should have something where we can bring everybody on the same page. So this is the first uh, objective of this particular talk. And the second objective is that many of you, uh, either students, a scholar, or even a faculty, want to start your work slowly with some baby step about OD, uh, by creating own ODE based model. So you may be, you know, working in dark that you, you want need some leads, right? So you need some basic introduction. You need some knowledge about the uh, books and lectures that you may go through so that you can learn them in detail, right? So this is the whole purpose of my talk uh, this afternoon. Now, uh, you must have noticed that uh, throughout our lectures, uh, what everyone was talking uh, was actually talking of graphs, right? And uh, uh, if you remember, uh, some people also said repeatedly that they are talking of static thing, their networks are static, and uh, they, they said that, okay, there will be some lecture on the dynamic aspect. So what do we mean when we say that we want to discuss about the dynamics or dynamical model, which is actually not captured by the graph theoretic things that we have discussed in last four or five lectures. So let, let us understand what do we mean by dynamics here in this particular context, right? So what I have shown here in this slide is that it is my Facebook network. Right. You can also, if you have a Facebook account, there are free apps. Uh, you can in the, you can you can log in to that, and then that app can actually draw a Facebook network. And you can see I I, I am in the middle uh, uh, somewhere. Let me take the pointer. So I am somewhere here, and you have these uh, other people are all the nodes, and as their friend, I have a connection with them. And you can easily see there are clusters, uh, even you don't need to do any mathematics here. And those clusters are coming because uh, different organization, educational institution I have went through. So if you look into this, this is possibly my Jadapur University friends. Uh, this is the people who are on the corner, are the people from my days in Ames. So they have distinct cluster and you can actually do lots of interesting thing out of it. Now, uh, in uh, just focus into one thing here. This plot, this graph tells only who is friend in my friend list in Facebook. It does not say anything about the dynamics of that friendship. What do I mean by dynamics of the friendship? Somebody who may be a friend in this list, 
I may not have made that person for ages, right? Or there may be another person to whom I meet every day on tea stall, have a coffee, and I may have today, you know, early in the morning, has a very bad argument, and I may have promised myself, oh, anyway, I will not talk to that fellow tomorrow. So this is a day-to-day -day dynamics that goes on and that affects all our life, saves our life, but that cannot get captured by this particular image that I have shown you here. So by dynamics, we want to mean that dynamics of friendship, which is not captured in that, right? And I'm not talking about somebody, suppose, uh, unfortunately, suppose I have unfriended somebody, and so that node will disappear from that figure. So with time, new node, new face may come into this network, old face may go away. That is also dynamic, but we are not talking of that dynamic. Here. We are talking about these nodes exist, and they have a dynamics, they have interactions, right? Now let us imagine that in terms of when we talk of protein-protein interactions. You have a East 2 hybrid system data, large scale data you have collected. You have A and B, two binds to each other. Your uh, East 2 hybrid has given a positive signal there. So you have made an edge between these two A and B node. But this diagram, this graphical representation does not represent, if you remember that this binding unbinding is a dynamical process. A and B will come and bind and then again unbind and eventually depending upon the concentration and binding rate constant, they may eventually reach an equilibrium, right? So those dynamics are not captured in our so-called static network or static graphs, right? So all the discussion of dynamics that I want to prime you to and other people will talk about is about this type of dynamics we are talking. So. <clears throat> Let us look into this dynamic issue at different level, different level in biology. I will start with molecular processes and then I will go to cellular level and then we'll go to, you know, organisms level. And every layer, every tire, you will find we have dynamics and this dynamics is important. So, for example, if you look into the single cell level, you suppose I have a pink colored ligand and it is coming and binding to a cell surface receptor, which is cognate to that particular ligand. And when it, this complex will be formed, again, remember this complex formation is also dynamics. The ligand once bound to the receptor does not remain bound eternally. It is going out, coming back, going out, coming back, depending upon rate constants of binding, rate constants of dissociation. And that varies from one ligand, one receptor system, it will vary. All any, any student of biology knows that in biochemistry textbook we have learned, and that may vary depending upon the surrounding, temperature, and other issues also. Now, once this complex is formed, that leads to a cascade of events, which we know are actually enzymatic cascade. In a cartoon diagram, I have shown it. So what you have here is that the molecules are getting activated. That means actually a inactive molecule enzyme is becoming a active enzyme. That active enzyme will convert another inactive enzyme into active enzyme and eventually a transcription factor may get modified, for example, by phosphorylation and it may move to the nucleus if it is a eukaryote one and then trigger a transcriptional process where mRNAs will be produced. Now remember, many times we forget that these mRNAs also get degraded. So all these things, starting from this cascade of enzymatic reaction to activation of transcription, and then production of mRNA, degradation of mRNA, and within that lifetime of mRNA, lots of proteins are created. All these things are dynamical processes and they are happening. And that is why many a time we see that uh, we insist that if I am supposed doing a, a pathway analysis by uh, treating cells, which suppose I have treated cells with EGF, and then I am doing a Western blot to measure the uh, ARC12 phosphorylation in Western blot, uh, people will insist that you do not do only, you know, one time point e experiment, but they will insist, okay, do Western blot with different time points, starting from zero point, time point, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, something like that. You have to decide what time, uh, time gap you want the samples, which is appropriate for your system, and then do the Western blot. And many of you must have done that, and you can see there that there is a change in concentration of that phosphorylated ERK can happen. Right? So those changes in the concentration of an active molecule obviously affects the downstream processes. 
as all processes in biological system at the lower level are chemical reactions so numbers or concentration controls everything right and those numbers and uh, concentrations are continuously changing and sometimes you may actually we may get fooled we may think something is actually not changing for example look into the next uh, example where i have said a pattern formation pattern formation is a classical example of pattern formation is pattern on the skin of zebra or something like that if you even don't look at that all our tissues has patterns right different types of cells they can come together and to make a uh, right a tissue type thing uh, a tissue or cellular organization will be there and for long period of time for a long period of time you will see this this pattern this segregation of cells or segregation of color are actually static right but if you look into the details you will find actually they are not static but actually there is a dynamics happening continuously and the system is actually in a steady state if you are a physiology student or uh, coming from other biological field you may call it a homeostasis when we talk in mathematical term we most of the time we can say equilibrium but uh, may, that may not be a right word to use because these systems are not at thermal equilibrium they are away from thermodynamic equilibrium uh, so it is better to say they are in steady state so visually at the macroscopic level when you are observing at the higher level when you are observing you see nothing changes my weight is not changing maybe in last last one month right but that does not mean my cells are not getting birth and my some cells are not dying that's continuously happening so i have a steady state right now now move from this pattern formation if you move to suppose spread of diseases now every other person is creating a model for how corona and covid spread so everyone every layman also know about sars model and other thing but eventually if you remember these models are dynamical models and these were one of the earliest model people started making this type of spread of infectious diseases model in 1800 and we are still using those basic ideas and basic equations till now even when you have this pandemic going on so they are also the process is dynamics dynamic right so one person get infected that person comes in contact with another person and that person get infected also so there is a dynamical process right so essentially as the title says of this slide the only constant in life is change if dynamic stops actually life cannot exist even though oh, macroscopically sometime we see things static below the hood you have actually dynamical processes going on and we are supposed we will talk about this type of dynamics and models to capture this type of so before i move into how the uh, these basic uh, you know simple elementary trick tricks and techniques and teach you those things let us uh, again uh, try to look into why these dynamics matter uh, i have seen uh, shown one cell signaling case uh, but don't go too much into details of these whether this is the only way things happens or not this is take it as a more of a metaphor i have given a reference uh, this uh, diagram i have taken from that reference that doesn't mean that the data of this particular experiment was present in this reference right but it is a review article which gives a very good review of what i am i'm going to talk now see if you have studied any cell signaling we see that we have some canonical pathways like right? pi3k kt pathway smat pathway uh, arc pathway okay there are connection between these pathway but eventually these are highways of information transfer from outside to inside the cell now although most of the time we have a cognate receptor for a ligand right we have a ligand receptor pair there are promiscuity we know there are promiscuity but let us uh, don't go into promiscuity now but in general think about it okay I, if i take egf i have egf uh, receptor and i have, if it is a nerve growth factor then i have ngf r receptor is there now if you look into the database of signal and signal transmission pathway you will see both egf and ngf after binding to their cognate Uh, receptor their respective receptors all of them uh, both of them actually activate arc path right now this can happen in other pathways also and there are hundreds of example you can give now the question comes that okay you in signal transduction this type of overlap of pathways happen but somehow cell discriminate different input signal this is the old problem people have worked on it and people are still working on it one way one way that cell can discriminate between 
signals which are activating the same pathway is depicted here. So what we are showing here is that if you do Western blot or something like that, you will see in the same cell when you treat with NGA, it is coming from one particular experiment. Remember that particular cell type they have used. You cannot generalize for everything. So you have NGF treated cells. They show that phospho ERK increases and then remains high for a long period of time. Maybe for two hours, suppose they have done the experiment. Suppose imagine. And whereas in when they treat the same cell line with EGA, what they see is that phospho ERK increases, but it is transient one. It rises and falls. And when they do the corresponding Western blots for CFOS, right, the phosphorylation of CFOS, they see that in case of NGA, it increases steadily and they remain high for a long period of time. Whereas for EGA, it is almost nothing. It is almost nothing, right? It rises transiently and most probably in Western blot, you will not be able to even detect it properly. And the end result, if you see, the cells treated with NGF differentiate into NAR12 cells, whereas EGF fail to induce but increases the proliferation. So again, I will say take it not by word by word, but take it as a gross example. So what is happening, and people have looked into this particular case of uh, FOS and ERK, actually they have a negative feedback here, and that negative feedback actually filters out this PRK transient rise. This transient rise of PRK are get filtered out by that negative feedback circuit, molecular negative feedback circuit, so that CFOS does not get activated. Whereas in this case, as PERK, as can be NGF, as PERK is activated for a long period of time, we get a very strong increase in CFOS, and that triggers other processes, other transcriptional processes, and eventually cells differentiate. Again, I will remind you. CFOS is not the only molecule triggering and leading it to differentiation. There are other processes. We are picking up this one to communicate what uh, we want to say right now. So this is one example where you see the dynamics of the signaling molecules concentration is time dependent change in the concentration. How they are increasing, how long they are staying high affects the physiology of the cell. And that type of question, actually, we want to study using dynamical models, and these will come repeatedly in multiple lectures you will hear. Let us contact another example, cell cycle. Monoj was saying in the first step that uh, they have some genes which keeps on in, uh, increasing because of circadian rhythm. Similarly, genes related to cell cycle have oscillation. What diagram I have shown is a very simplified model which is very good to teach a textbook uh, example to teach you know, modeling of cell cycle. So that's what I picked up. Don't go by those uh, simplicity. Essentially, we know cells before uh, division, it goes to G1, then the A's, then G2. So we have cycle from G1, it goes to A's, and then G2, and then eventually the cell division happen. Then again, it enters to G1, right? This cycle goes on, and we know that the cyclines and related molecule, they have oscillations also. So you can ask a question that, OK, cell cycle has uh, this oscillation. Circadian rhythm has oscillation. And in fact, we generalize that every clock has oscillation. So one can ask, what type of molecular circuit, what type of transcriptional circuit, or what type of transcriptional network can give rise to time-dependent oscillation in gene expression. You can ask that question, right? I'm asking a generalized question, not a specific one. You can do an experiment on a particular specific system, specific cell line, specific organism. But I'm asking a generalized question that what type of thing should be there in a transcriptional network so that you can have oscillation? One answer to that is actually you should have a negative feedback. And people have shown that experimentally and prove that mathematically that you should have a negative feedback in the right way so that you can get a oscillatory behavior. Again, dynamics matter and dynamical model captures this and make you understand uh, why that is happening. Let us take another example of cell cycle to make the uh, point more clear. One interesting process in a cell cycle, if you have done cell cycle experiment or you can, if you are doing something, you can try that. See, if we give a uh, signal, for example, using a growth factor, which will trigger cell cycle, right, cell division, and then as the process starts, if you withdraw that signal, people observe that cell cycle completes. 
That means as if you are using, you have a switch which you have pressed, and although you have withdraw your hand, the switch is stuck. In dynamical systems theory, we call this a hysteresis. And this property has been seen in sense cycle experiment, and people have shown mathematically that how this particular hysteresis property arises. That although the signal has decayed, but still for long period of time, the cell keeps on doing what it is doing, and then eventually that process stops and the whole cell cycle completes. So again, it is another example where dynamics matter and dynamical model can only give you the answer. Any static uh, graph model will not give you the answer. Now, the last example I'll give before I move into the main theme of the, the, this discussion today is that differentiation. And I believe uh, Mohit will talk about some, uh, some amount about that. Uh, differentiation happens in different level, in different cellular system, different organism. Let us generalize it. What I am meaning by in differentiation, I have a cell type A, and because of some external cue, some external cue has come to this cell, and then cell, uh, some of the population, some of the cells of this population, we can call a subpopulation, become cell type B, whereas another cell, uh, other population becomes cell type C. So we have cells are dividing into parts. Uh, my population of cells are becoming in dividing into part, not necessary in equal frequency, but they get divided, right? So cells are choosing, individual cells are choosing different path of development. Okay? This is very common. This happens repeatedly, fail safe. That's why you and me exist without this multicellular organism body, right? We otherwise, metage one cannot uh, be there. So it has happened fail safely every time. Now, <clears throat> Again, you can ask question here. Okay, if you look into uh, human uh, transcriptional regulation, we know there are uh, key transcriptional molecule which control this type of differentiation. If you go to uh, a lower organism, you will find another molecule, homologous molecule. We are not going into details of the molecular processes. What we are saying that what physical principle is there? What type of physical switch is there that controls that the cells of same type? takes two different paths. And what we say in terms of dynamical model is that this type of system, if you model and look into transcriptional network, you will find this type of system has what we call bifurcation. A cell is right now in, in a steady state. And uh, let me draw, it may be easy for you to understand. Uh, So suppose a cell is particularly right now in a steady state. It is in a steady state actually. But then as a signal comes from outside, a signal comes, there are two possible steady state now. Both are steady state. Two possible steady state are now. And depending upon the noise in the system, depending on the amount of randomness in the system, which you cannot avoid anyway, some of those cells in the population will choose this path and will go to one steady state, a new steady state, which is a different cell, and some of the cell will come here. This is typically known as bifurcation. We know now a lot about what type of transcriptional network can have this type of bifurcation. People have done large scale mathematical modeling simulation to identify generalized principle of that. And I believe Mohit's talk will have some amount of that and other people may be also talking about. So what I've done, I have given three examples to impress you that in different biological processes, dynamics matters and dynamical model try to capture them. And remember, dynamical model does not only try to capture what is changing with time and how much. It tries to understand the dynamical properties. Hope you are with me. Uh, let me discuss learn in this uh, next one and a half hour. Uh, so I will first discuss what do I mean by dynamical model? In, the, in mathematical dynamical models. Then I will discuss briefly how to write such sim, some example of very simple ODE based dynamical model. And then I will discuss about how to analyze those, right? Or rather numerically simulate those and all other options also I'll mention, but I will show you how to simulate those numerically. I'll show you a demonstration with a very easy to use software uh, which is very good if you are starting learning thing or if you want to teach in the class how to simulate and get different types of interesting behavior in your system. So let us start. Uh, so first, let us decide what do I mean by a dynamical model. 
By dynamical model, I mean a mathematical model which captures the time evolution of the system. But first, let us decide what is actually a system, right? We have a system as we have learned in our school when we start uh, learning physics and thermodynamics. System is de definition of system depends upon you, how you decide what is the system you have you want to analyze. So here also the system defined is defined by me who is making the model. Uh, I have a purpose for that. So for example, if I consider this example shown here where EGF bind to EGFR that activates AKT, AKT get phosphorylated to become active, PAKT, and then that activate FOXO a transcription factor, sorry, in, 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 inactivate FOXO by phosphorylation, whereas FOXO as a active form is a transcription factor and controls the expression of P50. Now, uh, so this is my system. How do I mathematically represent this system? The concentration of EGA, concentration of EGFR, concentration of AKT, concentration of phospho AKT, concentration of P15, phosphoxo and P foxos concentration, the concentration of these molecules define the system. And this concentration changes with time. So the system evolves with time. So my mathematical model will capture this change in concentration of this molecule. In some other cases, even in uh, you know this way molecular processes, you may think, okay, I will not use concentration, but numbers, right? Numbers of these molecules. If you are talking about modeling spread of disease, individuals are numbers, right? People are numbers, infected people are numbers, so not concentration. In that case, number of infected people, number of uh, uh, susceptible people, number of dead are actually as a whole representing the system, defining the system, and these numbers are changing with time. And our mathematical equation should capture, that. that is our goal. So what do I mean by capture? Why, why? What type of things do you want to look for? It? So if I have a plot, time versus concentration of any of this molecule, different types of behavior you can see. You can see oscillation. The oscillation can be stable. Oscillation can stay for some time and then, you know, decay. Or you may have something like this orange one, it may increase and it will become steady. So this steady one is actually what we call, uh, you know, a steady state. So this one is, this one is actually steady state, right? Now steady state, I will not discuss in detail. I, I hope other people will discuss in the, new, in the next other, other talks. Steady state can be two types. One is stable, unstable. What do I mean by stable steady state? Let me just briefly tell so that we can come uh, refer it uh, frequently. Stable steady state means, okay, the system has reached the steady state. Nothing is changing, right? Concentration of the molecule is not changing. But if you disturb the system, it will move away from the steady state. But after, after some time, again, it will come back to that steady state. So that means the stable. You can have steady state which are very unstable. If you don't perturb your cell, if you don't perturb your system, the system will remain at that steady state. But you do a slight perturbation intentionally, it will move away from that steady state. So that is unstable. Whereas for stable, with respect to steady state, uh, some cases you, you have the oscillation. So we many a times are interested to know why the oscillation is coming. Can I control the oscillation? What parameter of the model is controlling the oscillation? And uh, can I convert an unstable steady state into stable steady state by changing some parameter, some parameter which can be controlled by experimentally outside? Those questions people usually ask. So now if the dynamical model is defined this way, then how do I represent it mathematically? So what we use is actually differential equation and a particular type of differential equation we call ordinary differential equation. And there is nothing ordinary actually about them. But, but anyway, they, they, they are, uh, we call it historically, there are reasons to say it's ordinary differential equation. And what we do, we try to represent the rate of a process by this differential equation. If you have done calculus in your 12th standard, this part which I'll go into now is damn easy for you. If you have forgotten those things, but I'll try to recapitulate what we are doing here. Excuse me. <coughs> So suppose this, I have an example here, A is getting converted into B in a reversible process. I have rate constant K1 and K2. So then my model can be something like that. I write a differential equation on the uh, left hand side. This dB dt is the differential for B with respect to time, T. 
and something is there on the right hand side of the equal to that i will not go details right now but this is a function right this is a function of a and b so every differential equation will have a differential on the one side of the equal to sign and some function on this side and that is where the trick comes and i will teach you how actually people who model biological system use different functions to capture different types of biological processes because this is where what you know art of modeling comes and i'll explain that and many a times it may seems very counterintuitive why they are using that type of function and when you are reading a paper you may wonder why the hell they are using that function so i can similarly write another differential equation for a and obviously you can notice the signs will be opposite with respect to this equation that equation because this is just the reverse of the process no rocket signs here so uh, let us before i move into details how we write these functions and the problems in that let us uh, for p who has forgotten calculus just to remind you you know the differential equation can be of different types uh, this is ordinary differential equation because it has only uh, one uh, independent variable time is independent right it is flowing itself uh, we have no control over it time so uh, x is changing depending upon time so i have dx dt and uh, x is my dependent variable x is my dependent variable because it depends upon time a and b are constant in our language we call them parameters right and estimating parameter and proposing parameters for a model is actually a completely different discussion i will have as one disc one slide but it is a very a long discussion actually one another two hour discussion we may need for that now sometime in your model for the previous one also i had two may have two differential equation so we will call it a system of odes and as you can see here i have x and y both in dx dt right on this first equal od and then the second od i have also x so this system of od is called coupled because two ods of x and y are coupled right you cannot separate them out because to know dx dt you have to know y and to know dy dy dt you need to know x so this is a coupled system of od and most of the biological models are coupled system of od and this is linear or you don't have power of x and uh, to any uh, power for means power bigger than 1 for x and y but in reality for most of the biological problem you will have actually powers and we have non or other non linear term what i will not discuss is that there are some and a very large body of uh, dynamical models which deals with partial differential equation if you remember uh partial differential equations are systems uh, differential equations where i have more than one independent variable in my ordinary differential equations shown here dx dt equal to ax plus b x depend upon only t t is the independent variable but where what i have shown here is a diffusion equation or some of you may call recognize is that a heat equation actually they are same uh so the concentration of a molecule c suppose c depends upon t at the same time it depends upon position on the surface of something x and y coordinate x coordinate and y coordinate so imagine this suppose a molecule is uh, you know um, diffusing on the cell surface and then it is interacting with another molecule and getting uh, phosphorylated or something some reaction is happening just simplify it so the dynamics is not just with respect to time but the molecule is also in two dimension space of cell surface is moving so i can have a you know coordinate of that molecule in terms of x and y right so i have three independent uh, variable t x and y if you have a three dimensional problem then can have a z coordinate and uh, so you cannot capture this behavior by ordinary differential equation you have to use partial differential equation as i said we will not go into that and i think most of the talk i i believe none of them will go into partial differential equation based models so now uh, let us move into that okay this is what i am saying is a you know ode based model good enough uh, we will use o for, for to capture the dynamics of a system i will create a ode based models now as i said earlier that uh, the trick or art is how do i write the function on this side because remember this function on this right hand side should represent the dynamics of the system right otherwise why i am writing i can damn write any equations here right it has to be meaningful it has to have physical meaning right 
So let us look into the problems we have hand in hand when you are working in biology. The first problem is you rarely know details of the system. You have to accept. It is not just a problem in biology. In certain biological problem, it may be, you know, very prominent problem. But this, this is true for all science because science starts with observations, right? And all our observations are incomplete. We have to remember it as a student of science. We have to remember all our observations are incomplete and there will be always some amount of thing to know, right? So if this is a problem if you are creating a model, not just dynamical model, any types of model if you are dealing with your physics, your chemistry, whatever you, you are trying in biology also. So take a for example, suppose you are trying to make a, a transcriptional model for a, that example I said that the FOX will go and bind and, and re regulate the expression of P15. It is very easy to draw that cartoon diagram that the FOX is controlled. But if we have all of us biology students know that, you know, not just FOX, so there will be hundreds other molecules involved there. Many of those molecules I may not know. There may be modification of the structure of the genome at that moment and hundreds of other things which we may not know at all right now, right? Because for example, when I was doing PhD, nobody used to know what is miRNA and every gene expression control was thought of transcriptional control. And then came, you know, the methylation of DNA. That was a big deal that that can control transcription. And then when I'm a student teacher now, I know there are miRNA. So the same phenomena, which was initially explained in terms of uh, transcriptional control by transcription factor, then people tried to incorporate methylation pattern, then you know, maybe microRNA also involved in that particular control. So with time our knowledge increases, but we always have to accept we know really no details of the system. And the other problem that you have to understand is that is a typical problem in biology. In physics and um, engineering, we do not have much of that, is that we actually does not have very good first principle understanding. What do I mean by first principle is that uh, if you remember your school level physics book, a ball is rolling down on a ramp. You, if I give this problem, you will immediately use the law of conservation of momentum, use the laws of Newton's three laws. One of them, you will choose one of them appropriately, and you will write down those equation, dynamic uh, equations, and you will solve them to get the answer. So those laws are the first principle, right? If you are designing an engine of a car, you know the thermodynamics, you know the, all the thermodynamics rules and the other thing, are not cycles, those first principle things, and you can actually design on your design board based on those, right? In biological processes, actually, in many cases, in most cases, we have that limitation. We do not have this first principle based understanding. Now, what is the way forward? The way forward that we use mostly still now, apart from trying to develop first principle, is that try to create model something which we call similar to phenomenological model. What do I mean by phenomenological model? Don't get confused. Uh, yeah, phenomenology has a different meaning in different areas. So what do I mean by phenomenological model is that we want to capture the observed behavior, right? So you try to write functions and models which will try to capture the behavior. And I'll give you an example of that in later in the talk. Now, uh, another thing that we have to remember, what we do, like any other field of science, remember this is not unique for biology, is that we want to use the concept of Occam's razor, or you may aware of this word in another term is called parsimony. That the whole idea is you have to keep the model small and simple, as simple as possible. Try to make a simple model which still explain the observation and create, you know, a falsifiable hypothesis. It can it should be able to create a hypothesis which I can test by experiment. But don't make it big. Don't because you will not be able to compute. You will be able to analyze it. You will not have the parameter values, the constant terms to you. Keep it simple, small. Let the get the job done. None, none of your model, never on earth have anybody created a model which explain everything on the universe. And we are not planning to do that either. And in biology, you actually do that. If you remember, if you do the phylogenetic tree, we actually use the concept of parsimony there. If you have gone through bioinformatics books or uh, gone through the class, we call it parsimony, that we want the shortest distance to decide that who were the, you know, the, comes from the common mother or common ancestor. So the same idea there is keep it small and simple. So now uh, let us start with how do we uh, build models, right? 
So with keeping in those mind that I have to keep things simple, I do not know the first principle things, and I have to write down some function. Uh, so, but before I go into those tricky thing, let us take something which many of you may have in chemistry book, physical chemistry book, you have under studied, and this is uh, example of creating a ODE based model using first principle. What is that? A is reacting with B. Small a and small b are the stoichiometric constant. It is giving rise to C and D, a simple reaction. And we have famous law of mass action, which is almost 300 years old. And this law of mass action is the first principle. And if I have to create a, a dynamical model, so I will have a rate which is equal to by the law of mass action is equal to or rather proportional to concentration of the reactants A and B, each of them raised to some power. Those powers are A prime and B prime. And individual of this DA, DT, DB, DT, DC, DT, DD, DT are the rate by which D, C, B and A are changing with time. And as you can see, D must be increasing, whereas A must be decreasing. That's why I have a minus sign in front. But this equation, this relationship is coming from my first principle, the law of mass action. Now, can I use it in biology? The problem is you cannot use it in most of the chemistry, actually, because this is true, we know, is for elementary reactions, right? Uh, the simplest form of reactions, right? You one steps in the reactions. But this is not true for most of the complicated organic synthesis that people do in the chemistry lab. And this is certainly not true for, you know, by most biological systems. But interestingly, that what I have written here, this is very important to remember. Yes, law of mass action is not valid, but this type of relation that the rate will depend upon or proportional to concentration of reactants, this relation, this is logical, right? This is logical because if A is zero, then obviously no reaction will happen, rate will be zero. If B is zero, again, rate will be zero. If you increase A, the reaction rate will increase to some extent. Okay, you can argue enzymatic reactions may not be same. I'll come to that. But for most cases, you can actually imagine this proportionality will hold. So even though law of mass action is not valid in your system, you are free to use this. So now let us go into typical biological. What biological molecular processes are very common. One common process in biological cell molecular process is constitutive production. What is constitutive production? Think about constitutive production of housekeeping genes. The protein X is continuously produced. Remember, there is nothing at the tail of this arrow because when the protein is produced, obviously your gene does not get used up, right? It is permanently there. So as if, uh, you know, from thin air, you know, the protein is created. Anyway, we know, understand that. And uh, housekeeping gene continuously produced, suppose, right? So I can say like this, DX DT is, uh, suppose X is the concentration of that housekeeping gene. So molecule is equal to a rate constant, constant. It will always be there. Now, obviously, we know that there are uh, this constitutive production is not valid in most cases and may not be so interesting in studying also, right? You want to study things which you can you know, play around, you can induce from outside, suppress from outside. So suppose there is a signal S, for example, S may be IPTC that you are adding to your bacteria or S may be insulin that you have added to a cell culture. And that signal goes somehow, we don't bother how it goes, and then it, it induces production of X. So now you want to write a function on the right hand side of DX DT. DX DT is again the rate of the process is equal to, it should be dependent on the signal, right? When the signal is zero, I should not have any rate. When the signal will increase, the rate of production should increase. So I will use a something which we call in chemistry, fast order reaction right first order kinetics k s is a great constant into s as simple as that as i said keep things simple if it does not capture the, your system make it complicated right otherwise keep this simple let me keep it simple for the time being in future i will change it so similarly you can have constitutive degradation also although most of the time in biology lab we you know we are bothered about uh, uh, we, we measure by Western blood, uh, real-time PCR, we see gene expression and, you know, protein, we detect protein and mRNA, and we talk about how production is induced or suppressed 
we often forget that actually apart from production the mrna is also getting decayed and protein is also getting degraded so in some cases if you are saying that a particular transcription factor induces or trigger expression of a protein then you are supposed to do experiment showing that it is not a issue of you know uh, change in the rate of decay of mrna also right so decay is part of production along with comes hands in hand with production so just like constitutive production you can have a constitutive degradation so i can use a similar thing but remember degradation should depend this is degradation dx dt is degrading that's why i have a minus sign here uh, and i should have a concentration of x the concentration of the protein or the mrna or any other thing here on the right hand side because if that molecule does not exist then what should it degrade right so i should have a con concentration term for that molecule also on my right hand side similarly if you have induced degradation then you should have here uh, you know a signal term so that this signal is controlling the degradation of x i hope so far so good so i can com combine these two there is a induced production and degradation so i can write dx dt change in the there is a rate in change of x concentration the first term ksas is the rate of production minus kdx is the rate of degradation now with this information let us model a simple feedback circuit and then we'll simulate in between i'll stop to take any question if you have so this is a feedback circuit i have shown i don't know whether you can recognize I, i'll wait for a few minutes the seconds try to recognize feedback can be positive feedback feedback can be negative feedback x is here y is getting phosphorylated to yp x is a, a active enzyme you can imagine as a kinase p is a phosphatase right and p is causing dephosphorylation of yp to y s is an external signal imagine you may have added something from outside so if you look into this simple circuit simple network right it is a feedback feedback can be positive and negative i will pause for a few seconds just think about it it is a positive feedback or negative feedback i hope many of you may have guessed it is a positive feedback how s is coming and inducing production of x x obviously get degraded but as x increases x causes phosphorylation of y to yp as more and more yp accumulate that acts as an independent inducer to x so more x is produced so this is my positive feedback okay i want to model it and i want to see its behavior and actually it will show some very interesting behavior and people who do western blot for uh, phosphorylated protein they, they may find it very interesting so how do i do so i'll start with the simplest part okay i want to write the equation for x so dx dt what should be on my right hand side okay x has two arrows coming from this side and one is going out this is a degradation part this is the production part production is induced induced by s and induced by yp so just now one two slide back we have learned how to write uh, a functions for induced production i will use that so i will use ks into s this is the for induced production by s and ky into yp this is for induced production by yp Then the last term for this arrow of degradation. Again, I have discussed this earlier in the last slide, so I will have a degradation term and a minus because x is decreased. So, so it's so simple. And as I said, we always try to keep this simple unless we require. It. So let us keep it simple. Now we will move to the rest of the part of this side. So comes y, right? So next one is for this reversible reaction where a kinase. is phosphorylating y x is a kinase and p is a constitutive phosphatase which is working on y so this is a enzymatic reaction right and i from my experience i know if i have a enzymatic reaction that simple equation will actually not capture the behavior in general this enzymatic reaction are much more complex and if i simply over simplify it considering is simple first order and second order we will be in trouble so if i consider a simple enzymatic reaction where i have a substrate which in presence of enzyme becoming a product then the rate of change of p the product dp dt can be written as a second order equation that is k into e into s 
but most of the time it will not work because these enzymatic reactions are not so simple. So you have Michaelis Menten kinetics, and many of you may have heard people repeatedly say that most of the biological enzymes in cell does not follow Michaelis Menten kinetics, and I agree with that, but don't get scared about it. Again, we are not saying here that this system follows Michaelis Menten, rather, we want to use that type of function because that type of function has certain behavior and that usually matches with our system's behavior. So, if you have Michaelis Menten kinetics, what you do, dp dt is equal to a constant, right, into the concentration of enzyme into S divided by Michaelis Menten constant plus S. This is based on quasi steady state assumption. There is some modification of it which is called total quasi steady state. Both of them have similar hyperbolic behavior. People choose them depending upon their choices and the perspective and the conditions, assumptions they have. So let me use that. So the first part, how YP is created? YP is created because X as an enzyme working on Y to create YP. So I have first a Michaelis Menten term and I have considered total amount of Y, YT is constant. So this is in the first bracket. Yt minus Yp is concentration of Y, concentration of Y. And Yp is becoming Y by this phosphatase action, right? So this is my second term. This is also, uh, you know, inspired by Michaelis. So now I have done this part. So let us combine both of them. So I have this first equation already, dx dt. Second equation is for Yp, dyp dt. Both are ODEs, ordinary differential equation, but this is linear. The first one is linear, but the second one has non-linear term. And this is the system of ODEs because I have two ODEs and they are coupled because you can see X and YP appears in both the equation on the right hand side, right? So now once we have this model, we have to ask what to do with this model. But before I move into what I will suggest is that let us break and let me take some questions uh, from the, uh, if you have any questions, right? Uh, so I'll come here and if you have any questions, you can ask. Yeah, can you please go ahead? No, sir, I did not understand the second equation, how it appeared. Okay, uh, I'll go back. So this, this part I'm trying to create in the second equation, right? Uh, stay with me, on it, right? Uh, so, I have dyp dt. Now, on the right hand side, I have to write some equation. So, the first part should be production of dyp, uh, y, yp, right? Phosphorylated y. So, y is the substrate. y is the substrate for uh, this reaction. This y is the substrate. x is the enzyme, the kinase, which is causing phosphorylation of y. And I am assuming this arrow, this half arrow on this direction, y to yp is following Michaelis Menten kinetics. When I say it is following, I'm not meaning that it is following Michaelis Menten kinetics in all the bills and uh, things, right? What I mean that its kind dynamics has a similar behavior. And as I said, in case of this Michaelis Menten equation, the rate of product formation dp dt is equal to a rate constant k3 into concentration of the total enzyme into s divided by a constant plus s. The constant is called Michaelis Minton. So now here for this reaction, this part, I will use uh, your pen. Let me change. So this part is one Michaelis Minton for this one. You can easily recognize this is enzyme. This is substrate because this is y yt equal to yp plus y y is free unchanged y yp is phosphorylated y i am considering this is total and this is equal to constant that is my assumption you have a constant term here and you have the substrate again below is it clear anuj Okay, sir. Sir, I did not understand earlier what is that YT. Therefore, I was confused. Yeah, it's fine. I believe many men may not have understood. Thank you for pointing. I should have it written in the slide itself. Right. And the second thing is actually, this one is the second. Right. I believe everybody on page. So, 
let us move to next thing i have the model what to do with it so you have the model now you start asking question what type of question the first question which is the simplest and little question obviously and most of the time is actually boring is okay how with time uh, x and y will change time profile time versus concentration of x and concentration of y data it is most of the time is very you know boring thing you, but if you look into that data represent some other way try to make a physical meaning of it then it gets interest for example is the system reaching steady state what do i mean by that you is yp and x concentration increasing and reaching a steady state value if it reaches then you can ask is that steady state stable unstable all this question or if it is not steady state does x and y or any of them so oscillation this can be interesting then what type of oscillation stable oscillation damped oscillation all this question will come up and then you can think about what is the mean importance of that oscillation in physiology of the cell then there are certain thing called strange behavior i have written though there is not strange i just to shorten the whole thing for example we can have hysteresis we can have bifurcation that we talk with us briefly in the introduction as we change the parameters I mean, parameters mean this constant term k1 k2 michaelis menten constant the rate constant kd for degradation these parameters right these are constant in your model so when you change them does the system behavior changes drastically something you know uh, strange or enigmatic does it appear and again rarely in biology though but in other physical system and social system actually does the system has chaotic behavior these things becomes very interesting and enigmatic then and believe me you don't need a very complicated equations a mathematical to model to actually create a chaotic behavior or study very simple physical system with very simple ods can give rise to this type of you know chaotic behavior and very enigmatic behaviors i will not go into them but just to keep you keep those in mind so now if you ask this question how will you answer it? so this is now i will go into answering this question second part so you can answer this question multiple way the classical way would be analytically doing it but what do i mean by analytically analytically means you if you have done calculus in your school you have integrated equations right so you, you integrate these to solve the uh, function for x and yp and sometime actually to understand the stability and other long term behavior actually use linear algebra based method and they are very well established well known very old concepts but they are very powerful so that's why we use od based model so you can use them but i will not insist uh, i will discuss those here and i will not uh, ask anyone who is starting od based model to go into them because these you require some good amount of understanding of calculus as well as linear algebra otherwise you will get lost into it so better don't go into it if you are a beginner graphical method is a very old method hundreds of years old method which people have used very easy to understand if you know how to implement it this was bread and butter for mathematicians when we did not have any computer to solve equations and they are still powerful but they have a limited use so i will not discuss that either i will discuss numerical solutions how numerically you simulate this system in mathematical term we do not call it simulate the system we say we solve this system right but they are same thing that we will do and that's what i will show you and i'll show you how simple it is without any inhibition if you start practicing and going jump into it actually you can also do it so what do i mean by numerical solution simulation so there are method by which i can actually suppose i have this uh, model and if you tell me what is the value of x and yp at t equal to 0 means time point 0 then i can actually solve this equation numerically or simulate in my computer to tell what will be the value of x and yp at a particular time point so that is what numerical simulation and there are uh, standard uh, numerical algorithm euler's method 300 years old still going strong is the first one most of the method that we use now and most of the uh, software that you may use will have a uh, method based on ramakutta method which is very robust than euler's Uh, but euler is faster and simpler that's why many a time we still prefer it 
but most of the method that people use now in the ready made software or in library are based on runge gutta method which are much more uh, stable and stronger now you don't need to go into those algorithm unless until you are more interested if you know how to write programs then fortran c python matlab all have library functions you can write your own program using these algorithms solve your model that's what you need to do when you have a large system or you are doing large scale simulation for your model if you are starting if you have a small system if you are not doing large scale simulation then better to stick to ready made software with gui there are hundreds of them i have listed only few copasi db solve jpasi jigsaw kind solver these are all available free you can try them what i will show you is jsim and i actually ask people to start with jsim there are reason why i say to start with jsim you can get download jsim it's a java based tool you can download from this uh, link given here the website is filled with very useful information starting guide then the complicated thing advanced material they have a whole database of model ready made model which you can borrow reuse practice reuse in your work the best part of jsim is that it is between this writing program and using a black box remember when you use copasi or gpasi it's a black box you are just actually uh, not doing much here you cannot manipulate much beyond what they have done whereas if you do write a program in c you are you are the god of your problem you can do anything you want right so you need something in between which is easy to use and jsim is something like that you have to write a code but writing the code is damn easy i'll show you right and then rest of the thing is gui graphic user interface so graph will appear you can save the data you can visually change you have pull down menus very easy to implement so let us uh, uh, before i go into i i'll come out of this uh, presentation and i'll give a demonstration how i model that positive feedback using jsim right yeah i hope you can see a screen of uh, codes uh, molly can it be seen jsim can be seen yes sir it is visible okay so i have already started the program right so i have two panes here on the left hand side i have the code and the right hand side actually the messages come and the plots come so let me explain what we have here jsim has its own language just like any other programming language right so you have uh, don't get bothered here it is actually we are declaring that we are using jsim's math language and the name of the model i have given is model positive feedback and then i have this curly bracket which says the code start and i have the end of that curly bracket here to say the code has is over just try to understand what is the body of this see you are doing time time is your independent variable the concentration of x and y is changing with time so you are defining that here you are telling machine that see time is my independent variable and the minimum value of time is zero don't make time negative it has to be stopped at zero it's zero and its maximum value is i want 100 means up to 100 second or 100 minute or something we have not considered unit here you can consider unit but in this example i have not considered unit so what we are saying is that okay you you will go say and simulate up to 100 mean go start from zero and stop at 100 and this is t delta means i am asking okay don't collect data at every time point you take data at interval of 1 because i don't need so much of data then you are telling the machine see i have two dependent variable x and y and you see how nicely i have written the way in your math book you will write x in a bracket of t and bracket t means x depends upon t right so x and y p are dependent variable and that is what i am declaring to the machine now in your model you have lots of parameters signal a s degradation constant kd its value i have chosen 1.2 then you have michaelis menten constant km2 and km1 so these values you have to give it this is where limitation of numerical solution comes remember you are solving numerically in your computer so that means you have to give numerical values to the machine if you cannot define these numerical values you can change them if you wish but you have to give some numerical value to this otherwise computer will not be solved if you want to get rid of this numerical value you want to solve it generalized way then you have to use analytical and algebraic technique which many a times is very difficult to do actually believe me in fact even a phd student in math will stumble up on most of the time to solve analytical most of the time actually 
the biological models that we build. So you have to rely on numerical thing and you have to tell them this the model, these numerical values. This is one limitation, obviously, but we have a way out of that. Then you have to tell the machine what is the value of X and YP at time equal to zero. This is in maths term we call initial value prop, right? So you have to tell what is the value of X and Y at the beginning. Otherwise, how should I ca calculate that how the uh, value of X and Y will change? So I have taken here zero, zero. I have considered both of them has zero concentration. And then this last part, if you follow, is nothing but those two differential equation I have written. JCM cannot understand dx dt if I don't write this uh, colon based thing. X colon t for JCM is dx dt. Similarly, this the second one is dp dt. And the rest of the thing is actually nothing but the equations that you have seen. No big deal in that. So this is my model. Hope I do have not made any mistake anywhere. So I have all these buttons here. So I will compile it. Okay. If it works, compile. There should not be any message here. Otherwise, error message will come on your right hand side. And now I have come to my run pane where I can run my program. You can see all those numerical values that you have entered are here in the screen. For example, x init, this is the initial value of x, yp init, yp's initial value are 0 because you have set them. I can manually change it here also. I can make it 1, I can make it 10, whatever. Let us keep it 0. The simplest thing without going in complications, there are lots of other below the hood, easy to access thing. For example, I can use a different algorithm. I can choose. Do I want Euler? Do I want different or Rangakutta method? Do I want something else? Uh, JSIM allows you to do that. Don't go into that. Use the default one when you are beginning. Run. Okay, where is my data? My data should be in plot page. Okay, let me widen this. So what I have plotted here is I have plotted yp versus time. Nothing is written in the x axis. Let me write it time because JSIM by default will plot the time in horizontal axis and you can choose this vertical axis. I have chosen yp here. I can pull down and change it to x also. So let us take it to yp. Why? Because it's interesting if I am doing experiment. Usually by western blot we measure uh, unphosphorylated Y protein, phosphorylated protein. So suppose I have antibodies to detect unphosphorylated Y and phosphorylated Y. So I can measure. So in this case, if I do an experiment, you can imagine that if I have a zero hour sample, then suppose 10 minute sample, 20 minute sample, something like that. And then if I do quantitative image analysis of that Western blot, I may get this type of behavior. So just, that's just imaginary thing you can take on study. Now what you have here is that the system has reached a steady state because YP concentration has increased and then it has reached steady state. Nothing interesting here, right? Except that I am showing you how to use it. And believe me, if you are a student or a scholar, is a faculty who want to start in it, to have more or less understanding of differential equation, you have seen models, just download JSIM and start using it. It is so easy to do, right? So now let us do something a bit interesting. I will use this option called loop. Here, loop tab. I've already populated my thing. What I want, I want to change the value of S, the input signal, right? Because input signal you can manipulate from experiment outside, right? For example, I said, suppose if it is involving, uh, suppose it's a pathway where Y is getting a phosphorylated by YP, suppose X, S, the input signal is a growth factor, right? And you can control how much growth factor we will put in your cell culture. So that is represented by 0 0.3, 0 0.075, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, something like that. I have lots of them I have kept. Okay. And I want to see if I change S, how YP behavior changes with time, right? And remember, all S is given at zero time. I don't need to manually repeat this simulation. Here I can do run them all together by loop run. Okay, it took a couple of seconds. Now you can see very interesting thing. What I have here for some value of S, okay, for all value of S, the YP value, which is in the vertical axis, has reached steady state, some steady state, either lower or higher. But for some value of S, it has reached a lower value, whereas some other value of S, it has reached to higher value. 
So now I have something interesting in my model and maybe in experiment also we can get that. I'll come back to that. Now I'm sure you'll agree these graph look clumsy. I myself find it difficult and I'm sure you are also finding it difficult. So JSON has an option. I can actually export data and I have exported that data. So I'll go back to my PowerPoint slide where I have made beautiful plots using this data so that it becomes much easier to understand. I'll show you two plots. One where S is kept at a particular value, just the previous simulation that I did. And the second plot what I will show is that where I will not show time versus Y. I will not show that. What I will show, I will collect data, the steady state data. For example, at 100 time point, I will take the value of YP for each of these simulations for different values of S and I will plot. So you can understand some S steady state value will be low, some will be high, and then we'll plot it and see how does it look and does that give some meaning in biology or not. So bear with me, I'll go back to my uh, uh, PowerPoint back. So I'm back to my PowerPoint. So here we have. So this is my initial simulation. I kept S equal to 0.3. Signal was at 0.3. This is my model. These are the numerical value of parameter that I have used in my simulation. And I have saved the data and plotted in Sigma plot time versus YP. As you can see, the YP is increasing, right? In YP is increasing with time, YP is increasing with time, and then saturating at a steady state. Fine. We have seen that and it is a better representation. Now the second experiment. I have different values of S. <coughs> Excuse me. Starting from a low value of 0 0.5, 0 0.05 up to a value of 1. And you have seen the simulation. I have taken the steady state value of YP from each of those simulations, and those are tabulated here. And what plot I have made? I have made the signal, input signal S versus the steady state value of YP in the vertical axis. So you can see here for up to around 0.35 or something, the steady state value of YP is very low. Whereas just after that, you have made a slight jump 0.35 to 0.36. You see, you notice here 0.35 to 0.36. And what is the jump? YP is changing from 0.1 to 0.9. Huge jump. YP is getting completely phosphorized. Now, if you have done Western blot of phosphor protein, sometime you may have also seen this type of behavior. You have dose dependent Western blot. You are treating cell with some growth factor or some other drug or something, and you are measuring some phosphorylated protein. And you see that initially up to certain dose, you do not get almost no signal from phosphorylated protein. And then you slightly change the input signal the, in treatment with the drug or growth factor. All of a sudden, there is a huge increase in phosphorylated protein. One reason maybe is that in that system also, you may have a positive feedback. Positive feedback give rise to, known to give rise to, obviously the parameter has to match give rise to this type of behavior where you have completely two domain, one low, one high. We call it on off domain. This region I can say is off state, whereas this is on state. If your input signal is high beyond this 0.36, the system will be on. Otherwise, it will be off. Now you can imagine if YP is involved in some other cellular processes, if the signal is up to this region, in this region, those work will not be done in the cell. But if you slightly increase the input signal, the cell will start doing those work because YP will become very high. So now let me take uh, another system. And with this, I will I'll explain this one and then we'll move into uh, almost reach the end of my discussion. Till now what I have discussed, I have discussed about a positive feedback and before that I have discussed about constitutive production, degradation, enzymatic things and all these things we discussed. But I have not discussed about transcriptional regulation, right? What type of function one should use? Because in the coming talks, when the people will talk about making synthetic genetic circuit, their model you will see very frequently, model ODB based model of transcriptional network. 
what type of equation they do use and why do they use those type of equation that we have to understand very carefully. So I had to understand that I have used a very simple transcriptional network. I have chosen it from a textbook because uh, it is easy to model and it can give very interesting behavior. That does not mean you will find it very frequently or something like that, right? Just use for instructional purpose. Remember, what I have X is a gene from which I get the X protein. X protein get modified and become Y. Y get further modified into Z. And Z itself as work as the active transcription factor and inhibit the production of X. So this is also a feedback, but this is a positive feedback. This is negative feedback. X is sending a negative signal to itself, right? I want to model it. Now I can use my constitutive production degradation approach to represent it. But we know transcription and uh, is not so easy, right? Transcriptional control has certain interesting behavior. So we want to capture that in our model. So what is that interesting behavior? Initially shown for IPTG, but then for many other transcriptional system, it has been shown that if you plot induction ver inducer versus expression level plot, inducer in your horizontal axis and your vertical axis, you have expression. As you change or increase inducer, you do not see a linear increase in expression. Rather, what you see is that a sigmoidal behavior, and sometimes you may have a hyperbolic also, but it will increase like this and then saturate. And many a time, most of the time, you can have a sigmoidal behavior. So, up to certain level of inducer concentration, suppose there is an IPTG concentration you're adding, there will be no or very little expression, and then all of a sudden, increased expression will increase. So just a simple first order, second order equation cannot capture this behavior. So if this behavior is present in this inhibitory thing, then I cannot use a simple second order, first order thing to capture the behavior. I have to need, I need some other function or equation to capture this behavior. Now let me remind you, there are hundreds of uh, functions and you may create another new function, 101 for maybe for two, function which can have this type of sigmoidal behavior. But I have to choose a function which is small, simple, and has some sort of meaning. So that's why biologists usually pick up Hill function. If you have studied biochemistry, then from the um, how hemoglobin works, saturation of hemoglobin, you know the Hill function there. In that case, your uh, YP will be oxygen saturation and a X will be partial pressure of oxygen. So this function y equal to x to the power n divided by k to the power n plus k to the power x to the power n is a sigmoidal function. I'll show the graph. So suppose x induces y expression, then I will use this type of function. x is the inducer concentration. n, which is in the power, is called Hill coefficient. k below is called Hill constant. Now what type of sigmoid behavior is this? Here I have a plot. You can see for different values of n and k I have plotted, all of them are sigmoid. And if you carefully check, k is actually half saturation concentration. When k is equal to x, capital K is equal to x, y will be half actually. So this is what I have shown by the dotted arrow here. So k is actually half saturation. So this function is simple. I have only two parameter n and k, and it gives me sigmoidal behavior. That's why in most, overwhelmingly most, uh, majority of the transcriptional network model, you will find people using Hill function. Now you must be thinking that this is for induction, right? When x is zero, there is no production. When uh, x is high, we have high production. But in this diagram, x is getting uh, X is the gene which is regulated negatively. So when this portion Z will increase, X should decrease. Hill function will not capture. Yes, we can manipulate it and we can have a hill inverse Hill function. And that will be used in this particular model I have showing. showing. So that will be K to the power N divided by K to the power N plus X to the power N. Don't get confused with this X and this X. These are different. This is generalize x and y I'm right. So now let us write down the ODE for this model. So dx dt, that is the production, uh, the rate of uh, change in the concentration of protein Px 
is equal to beta a constant I have considered, and I have a inverse L function. And in the denominator, uh, sorry, denominator, I have z, right? Because z is controlling, so z is in, uh, inhibiting, so z is here, z to the power n. And the next part, minus alpha x, is nothing but the constitutive degradation of x. For y and z, I have kept things simple. y is getting produced by a from x, so k1 into x, one term. y is becoming z, so I have minus k2 into y. y must be getting degraded also, which is not shown here, is k3 into y, minus k3 into y. And dz dt is k2y minus k3z. So for the sake of simplicity, I have kept them simple because these may be simple modification. X is getting phosphorylated or something like that. So I have kept simple thing. Uh, and whereas this one, I want to capture this high, you know, sigmoidal behavior in transcriptional control. So that's why I have taken an inverse function. Now, what will happen if I simulate it? I will not show, almost we, are, we have 15 minutes left, so I will not do the simulation, but I had the code here in JSIM. You can again simulate in JSIM. So what I have done, I have done repeated simulations, and I will show some interesting behavior. So in this equation, n is Hill coefficient, right? And I have initially considered it 3. And then if you see what happens, x increases, and then it drops. Obviously, it will drop because I have a negative feedback. As x increases, y also increases. There is a slight delay because from x, y has to produce. And as y is produced, more z is produced. So there is a time delay again. But then as z becomes high, it suppresses the production of x. And x is getting degraded simultaneously by this alpha x. So x falls. And then it oscillates slightly, the damp oscillation, and I get a steady state. So this is damp oscillation and steady state. Again, nothing interesting actually. But now let us change the value of n. n is a measure of how strong is the interaction of z on this uh, you know, uh, promoter region. So let us make uh, consider that z interacts very strongly, very strongly, right? And uh, so it's inhibit strongly. So let us make n equal to 20. It's, you know, it, it, it is ridiculously high. In biological system, it will not be n equal to 20. Just to impress you that what type of behavior can come and just for teaching, I'm saying n equal to 20 and you see what happens. Now you get a stable oscillation. X is increasing, in decreasing, increasing, decreasing. Initially, the amplitude is high and then it decays, but then eventually it gets stabilized. I will not discuss those. This type of oscillation, forget about value of n, these type of oscillations are very frequent in gene expression circuit, metabolic circuit, and even in your biochemistry book, you may have heard of the word called limit cycle oscillation, because initially they have a high amplitude, and then they fall on a particular limit cycle where they keep on oscillating. So this is a typical simplest uh, maybe ridiculous model to which can give you a real limit cycle oscillation. So far, so good. Uh, now I will discuss one sticky issue that I am not going in detail because I said it may take two hours, three hours to discuss. As you said just now, value of n, n is a parameter or constant in your model and it can change the behavior. So your conclusion from your model depends upon model parameter. And in this uh, equation, all the rate mark things are parameters, constant. And the question is, how will you know those values? Without knowing those values, you cannot do numerical simulation. And you can see here, I have so many parameters. I have to know one, two, three, four, five, seven, nine. Nine parameters value I have to know, put them correctly in my model, then only I can simulate, right? I can change some of them. Right, but I cannot change them arbitrarily, right? I cannot make any real project. I cannot convert n to 20. I have to make a rational change. So how do I get those parameters? Before I go into that in a short discussion, that just try to remind you that is why we insist making model is an art and you try to use the Occam's razor or parsimony to keep the model simple so that you have very less number of parameters in your model. Now, how do I get the model parameter? 
The most common approach is using educated guess. What do I mean by educated guess? Usually there are standard technique by which you can actually get rid of the units. We call it making dimensionalized dimensionless and then you can actually make a very logical case. For example, alpha here is degradation rate constant. Beta is the production rate constant. Obviously, you cannot choose a value of alpha that X value will become negative because concentration of a protein cannot be negative, right? So there must be a balance, right? And usually we know degradation rate constants are usually lower than rate constant for production of production of a molecule. So you can say, okay, if I vary, vary alpha from 0 to 1, I will vary beta from 0 to 10 or 100, something like that. So this type of educated case people do, and then in a small domain, they try and use and simulate the model and try to see the behavior. Some cases you salvage old model. You take old model from different databases and takes a paper. You look into some parameter values they have used. Those parameters may have been derived from experiment. Those experiments may not be exactly the experimental system you are using, but close to or similar to that. For example, you need a Michaelis maintain constant for a phosphatase. You may not have that one in your experiment, but you may consider, okay, most of the phosphatase in the cell may be possibly have the similar Michaelis maintain constant. So you, you reuse that. Value. Another method, which I personally think can give rise to wrong again, interpretation is fitting your model to experimental data. The first problem in doing that is that, for example, suppose I want to uh, fit uh, this uh, behavior model to data. That means I need lots of point, data point, lots of sampling in my experiment, and then I can use some regression based or other type of method to fit my model, right? People do that very frequently. You will find that type of paper. But remember, all data fitting suffer from overfitting, particularly in biological problem, because you have very less number of data points. Your samples number is less, and you are over. And actually, you are you know forcing the model to fit. So there is a, most of the time you suffer from the problem of overfitting. Another better approach is actually rather than creating one single model for your problem with any of this technique, educated case or something, you create an ensemble of models. That means you create multiple models, thousands of them with different parameter combination and you do large scale simulation. And that's why I said you need to learn CE Fortran or something like that because JSIM will not help you. Kipasi will not help you. In that case, you need your own code. You put it in a server and 1,000, 10,000, 20,000 parameter combination you do and you do different uh, simulation and then you analyze those data. Then it becomes actually a large data set for you. And from that ensemble data, you try to find out what type of different behavior that can come in your model, right? So you are deciding a goal post and then you do experiment whether any of them appear in your system or not. I personally believe this is one of the best is the best approach actually because you are not defining exactly what will happen but rather you are saying what is possible what all these things physically possible that's what you are saying. So uh, let me jot down the key point before I move into some educational things which may you may find useful few of them. The first point is that uh, by we, we need to create dynamical models because not just the components, just not just the protein, not the individual, not just the cell, only their mere presence does not create life. Every phenomena in life depends upon the dynamics, time dependent change in those things, and we need to capture those dynamics and we have to understand that. The second thing is that these dynamical models that we make using ODE captures the time evolution of a system. Now we have to remember we have to always, not just in biology, in everywhere, every field of science, we try to create a model which is simple, small, but still useful. You may have heard thousands of times before, but still I will re repeat, any model, every model is wrong model, some of them are useful, right? So we have to maintain, that, uh, remember that. And the second thing is we have to use functions which has meaning, but simple meaningful with your context. Maybe it may not be meaningful in my context, so I will use a different function in my ODE based model. And then you can analyze the model using analytical, graphical, and numerical method. I have shown numerical method. I'll strongly encourage you 
to start using that and you will get habituated very easily and you will find then it is very easy to understand those papers or lectures where they use OD based model and you will be able to understand them very easily. Now let me show give you some educational thing, uh, pedagogic thing. If you uh, forgotten everything about calculus, but you have studied in 12th standard or you are very, uh, you know, determined that you will learn calculus, then there is a very good book which handled step by step with lots of figure for almost geometrically explaining everything. You know, if you complicated thing in mathematics can be explained very easily using geometrically. So this book, Biocalculus, Calculus for Life Science is must for you. Try to grab it, start from first page, step by step it will teach you calculus, not just a simple calculus, even you know vector calculus also and linear algebra, everything step by step. It's a very good book and I recommend it to everyone starting. If you are habituated with OD, you are coming from chemical engineering background or other background where you, you, you are comfortable ODs, but you have not done much work on uh, mathematical modeling for long, you can start with this book, which is again very bo good book with lots of graphical explanation is modeling the dynamics of life. And in fact, this does not only deal with, you know, uh, simple uh, molecular processes, it goes to disease modeling, epidemiology and other things also. So you will get a vast array of problems here and lots of solved problem, you know, other things there. So it's a very good book for those type of people. If you are a seasoned math uh, person, math, uh, somehow you want to leave other fields of math and then want to come to mathematical biology, the standard textbook of mathematical biology teach in math department across the globe is the first and second volume of Murray's mathematical biology. Again, this is just like Gita in mathematical biology. It covers multiple things. The edition has got a bit low, old, but still this is the, uh, you should start with this actually, or if you are starting teaching in your math department, you should start with this book actually. Now, if you do not enjoy reading book, but start want to start something visual or, or uh, you know, or what we say, we, or YouTube based thing or something like that. Uh, my MOOC on uh, introduction to dynamical models in biology will start from 23rd August. You can join that. You will obviously, if you appear for the exam, uh, you will get a certificate. If you say you do not have time for joining all these NPTEL course or, or something, then remember this is a rerun. So all the videos are available in this YouTube link playlist, right? So you can go there. I will upload this, uh, send this uh, PDF, right? So you can always uh, visit this playlist and mark it and see the videos. These videos are meant for people who are not well versed with calculus. Little bit of calculus is there, but most of the thing are conceptual and graphically explained and the graphical technique which I have not discussed here are discussed in details there. If you want something more, uh, what do you say, raw and more uh, mathematical, then uh, from last year, I, I teach a systems biology course for almost 12 years now here. So I have made the videos of those course, that course. So all those videos are there in this uh, link. You can go there, but remember this is for people who are in general comfortable with calculus and linear algebra. Now, if you want something much more complicated and hardcore, then you must visit, you may have read the book of Steven Stogas, but you, there is a video of his course, right? Live courses, not nonlinear dynamics and chaos. It's a must for you, right? So I have arranged them books and video lecture as per the difficulty level. You can choose depending upon that. With this, I will end and if there is any question, I will take. Thanks a lot for staying with me.